let's get started. Thank you for coming out on a Sunday morning. I know it's very difficult. We all like to sleep and maybe you went partying yesterday and you're a bit hangover. Um, if you were at the previous talk, I guess Anastasia just woke you up with a lot of interesting demos. I'm going to bore you to death with authentication. Um, so I'm going to be talking about JSON Web Tokens and how to use them with single page applications. Who's ever used a single web token, a JSON Web Token before? Okay, keep them up. Who knows how they work? I see some hands going down. I hope by the end of this talk you have at least a vague idea of what a JSON Web Token is exactly and how they work and how you can use them to secure single page applications. This is a JavaScript conference, so I assume most of you are uh, from the developers who are working with JavaScript. Is that correct? I see some heads nodding. Perfect. All right. So let me quickly introduce myself. My name is Sam Bellum. I'm a developer advocate engineer at Auth0. And if you've never heard of Auth0 before, we're an identity as a service provider, which basically means that we try to make it as easy as possible for you to implement a secure authentication flow so you can just focus on building your actual products, your websites, your mobile apps, whatever you're building. Um, I'm also a Google developer expert, which means absolutely nothing. Um, I organize a few meetups, one in Belgium, which is Frontage related, and one in London, which is the Identity and Security Meetup. So if you're ever in Belgium or in London and want to join, please do so. We're all nice people. And you can find me on the internet as uh, Sambego. I have a bunch of cat stickers. So if you would like to have a cat sticker, just send me a picture of your cat, your dog, your, we're in Tropical Island, your dolphin. Um, uh, send me a tweet with a picture, um, and I'll give you some stickers after this talk. OK, so let's get started with the real business. What I'm going to be talking about today is a bit about traditional authentication, or what I view as traditional authentication on the web. Uh, we're going to see what a token is, because I can talk about JSON Web Tokens, but I also have to explain what a token is. Um, we're going to be talking about token-based authentication, and we're going to see a little bit about the future of authentication, so we're, since we're talking about single-page single page web applications. They're modern, cool, new uh, applications, so let's see a bit into the future what um, we can do with authentication. All right, traditional authentication. To me, traditional authentication is a, or a traditional web page is a, is a web page that is um, generated on the back end. So you do a request, um, you click on the link, your, you do a request to your server, it's going to generate an HTML page and send this back to the browser and the browser renders this. There's always going to be a refresh. All of, all of the logic or most of the logic is going to be handled on the back end on your server. Um, and the front end is just basically HTML, CSS, and some JavaScript to enhance it. Um, to show the web page. And if you have this traditional scenario, you have a user who goes to your web page and the web page and the web browser does a request to your server. Um, but when the user wants to request a page that is protected, a page that the user needs to log into, um, the user is going to type in a username, it's going to type in a password, um, we're going to send this to the server. And if this username and password or this email address and password match, the server is going to say, okay, this user has some access to this, uh, this web page and it's going to send the, um, the page to the browser, which will then render this. I think this sounds familiar to most of you, right? Yes. Um, and it's not only going to send a, the web page, the HTML page, it's usually also going to send a cookie, which is going to be stored in the browser, just so you don't have to log in time and time again every time you want to request another protected web page. So this cookie is going to be stored in, by the browser. And the next time you want to access a protected page, the browser is going to send along that cookie. The cookie contains usually a session ID. And if that session ID is still valid, the server is going to be like, ah, oh, you logged in previously. The session is still valid. Here is the page you requested um, without asking for the username and password again. So that's a traditional web page to me. And there's a few differences between this kind of web page and a single page application. The first one, a traditional architecture is usually a single server. This can be a bunch of servers, but there's a single backend handling most of the logic, generating the pages and sending this to the front end. Well, with a single page application, you can have something like this. You can have an API that handles your user data. You can have an API that handles your payment data. You can just have a general API for uh, any other data you want. You can have external services, microservices. You can have a bunch of different services, and you want to authenticate with all of them or some of them. And this might be a problem, because if some of them are in a different domain, you will run into course issues. Um, and that's sometimes a problem. You can also have something like this, a mobile app, a desktop app, a, a, a web app, and they all want to communicate with the same API. So you would like to have the same way of authenticating with that API for all of these different um, applications. 
But the thing is, cookies is something that's inherently only used by the web. It's something invented for the web. It does not get used by a mobile app. It does not get used by a native uh, desktop app. So they use a different way of authenticating. So it would be nice if we could at least more or less use the same system of authentication of proving that a user has logged in and is allowed to see a certain resource or get certain data um, across all of these apps. And as I said, a cookie is something from the web. So we cannot do this. Um, so what problems um, do we have with a traditional cookie-based approach? I already touched on this, cores. Who likes cores? <laughs> Nobody likes. If you have a course problem, the first thing you do is you go to Google, you type in, I have a course problem, you end up at Stack Overflow, there's one answer from one guy in the whole world who knows how to solve a course problem. You're going to read that and just apply that to your code. Nobody likes it just because it's a hell. It's always a pain in the ass to work with um, cross origins and do requests and use cookies and stuff with that. So if you have different APIs, different services, you will run into these problems pretty fast. Cookies require state because usually this cookie um, contains a session and that session ID is something that is just an ID which you save in a database and it contains an expiry date and maybe some other attributes. But with APIs these days, we want to have stateless APIs or at least as stateless as possible. So for a cookie, we usually require some state. Um, and cookies don't flow. You cannot pass along cookies generated by a certain domain, a certain server, a certain API to others um, because they're generated on an origin basis. Um, so you cannot just pass them along through serv ser uh, several serv service services. Um, so for example, if one API wants to have the same authentication data or session ID as the previous one, you cannot just pass them along that easily. So what's the solution? Maybe it's token-based authentication. We're going to talk about that later. But first, what is a token? To me, a token is a unique identifier that represents something as long as you can take this token and get some information, information out of it, some meaningful information, that's a token. A token can be a lot of different things. You can have a lot of different kind of tokens. We have access tokens. Who's ever used an access token before? I see some hands. Most of you have used it before. Who's ever used an ID token before? A little bit less, but still a lot of people have used it before. A refresh token. I should all be a little bit scared when I say refresh tokens because there's some things wrong with them, especially with single page applications. We're going to see that later. But most of you have used at least one of these tokens before. Um, and they're often just an opaque UUID, a string, which does not have any meaning except that it's saved in a database and you have some other attributes saved in a database with that ID as well. But it doesn't have to be that. It can be XML. If you've used SAML before, the SAML tokens are just a bunch of XML. And it can also be a JSON up token, which is what I'm going to be talking about today. And a JSON up token, as the name states, it's JSON. It's a, it's a bunch of JSON. Um, at Auth0, we use them as much as possible just because we think they're very powerful and we really like them. Um, that's just an aside. And this is a JSON web token. And if you look at this, it just looks like a bunch of random characters, numbers, whatever you want. You don't really see any meaning behind these characters. But if you look closely, you see that there's two dots in this, in this long string of characters, and they, they separate three different parts of this JSON web token. You have the top part, which is in red, which is the header. Then you have the main part in the middle, which is a payload, and the bottom part, which is the signature. So a JSON web token will always have two dots, and they will separate the three different parts of a JSON web token. That's the first thing you need to remember about JSON web tokens. They contain three different parts, and the first part is the header. Now, what is the header? It basically just contains a bunch of information about the token itself. Um, this is basically just a Base64 encoded JSON object. So if you would take something in JSON, Base64 encoded, you would be able to get something like this. So if we decode it, um, what you see is we use algorithm HS256. It can be in a whole bunch of different al algorithms. And it says the type. the type is a JSON web token because we're working with JSON web tokens, right? The same goes for the payload. Again, it's just some JSON which we base 64 encoded um, to make it more compact and to make it easy to send uh, with every request. But if you decode it, it's again a bunch of JSON. And it can contain a bunch of information depending on which use case you're using for this token. It can get to, uh, have some information about the user, um, so the user ID, the subject, the given name, family name, username, when it's issued and also when it expired expires and that's very useful to know because a JSON web token can contain its own expiry date. So after this date, this exp, which is some milliseconds since 1970, um, 
when this date has passed, you will not be able to use this token or you should not be able to use this token since it has expired. Now, any of those uh, key value pairs in the, in the payload are called a claim, and there's a few different kinds of claims you can put in a JSON web token. The first one are reserved claims, and these are the claims that are, that are specified by the JSON web token spec. Um, they're standardized, you cannot use them for anything else except what they're meant to do. So subject, issuer, which um, API issued or which authorization server issued this token. Um, when they're issued at, the timestamp, when they expire, there's a few others, but these are all standardized by the um, by the spec. The second one are public claims. Um, and these are not standardized by the spec, but there is another standardization um, body, which is IANA, which tries to standardize non-standardized things on the web, because you can never have too many standardizations. Um, and they take a bunch of information that's commonly found in a JSON web token and just made a list of it, just so you can expect a JSON web token to always have that kind of information with the same name. For example, family name instead of last name. For example, given name instead of first name, just for API interoperability, if you get a JSON web token for, from a certain service and one from another, you kind of want to have the given name or family name in the same way, just for ease of use. Um, and there's a whole bunch of these. If I can find the right tab. And it's on the IANA website, and as you can see, there's a whole bunch of these nickname profile websites. Um, you don't have to use these, but it's just as a matter of um, standards that it's easy to use them. And then lastly, private claims, and this is basically anything you want to put inside of a JSON web token. If you think it's relevant for your use case, and if it's valid JSON, of course, because we're working with JSON web tokens, you can put it in. Um, a good thing to know, this payload is just a basic C4 encoded object. So don't put anything sensitive in there. Don't put credit card numbers, passwords, anything sensitive in there, because we all can go to base64encoder.com, paste it in there, and see what's in there, right? Um, so don't do that. Lastly, we have the signature. And that's not a very nice feature of JSON Web Tokens. The signature will, vali will validate your JSON Web Token, because what we're going to do is we're going to take a base64 of your header, base64 of your payload, run it through some signing algorithm, in this case, um, we use HMAC um, and we use a secret. And just because we put the header and the payload inside of it, we get a signature. If you change something in the header or the payload, your signature will change. So if somebody tries to change something in the payload in the middle of your authentication process, the signature will not match. So you can, you can figure out that somebody tried to tamper with your JSON web token just because the signature does not match anymore, which is one of the features of a JSON web token, which makes it a bit more secure. Um, JSON web tokens can be verified. Um, usually your secret is a bit more secret than uh, your super secret key. Um, I think we all know that. Um, so if we do this, if we take a base64 of our header, which is some JSON, we take base64 of um, our payload and do some signing, we, and we paste all of those three things together, we get a JSON web token. And now if we would uh, have a look at this token, if I paste it in, we can see that my name is Sambalan. It's maybe a bit small, um, and there's a space missing because I made a bug. But basically, we have the JSON available if we know how to decode the JSON web token. So some real world examples, because it might still be a bit abstract what a token is and how you can use them on the web. An access token, as we've seen before, most of you have used them before, can be something like this. And an access token is, some, is a token that you use to uh, authenticate with an API, with a service. So it's going to contain some information which is relevant to that use case. For example, who issued it, which authorization server, um, about which user we're talking, so it's usually user, user ID. Um, and then uh, which audience, which APIs can use this token. Um, if you don't specify this, you don't have to, but you leave it open to any service to kind of use this token, which might be a security issue. So you should always try to uh, include the audience, the available, or the APIs you want to be able to use this token. But when it's issued at, when it expires, and maybe some scopes, because when you, uh, you, when you use an API, you might want to define some scopes, like a certain user, user has access to more um, features of your app than certain other users. These are usually scopes. So for an access token, you define all of this data which is relevant to use with an API. For an ID token, it's a different kind of token. It's a token which contains some information about the identity of somebody who authenticated. So it will contain some information related to the identity, the username, the first name, maybe the, the profile picture, and again, an expiry date, just because we want to know when this token expires, right? Um, 
And if you want to do this with JavaScript, you can do it like this. But there's a bunch of libraries out there which do it way better than this. Um, so just use a library. And up until now, we've seen symmetrical algorithms, which means that we use a signing algorithm that uses a shared secret to encode and decode the, uh, the signature. But we also have um, asymmetric algorithms, a whole bunch of them. I'm not going to go through all of them and what the differences are. But the good thing to know is that these algorithms, instead of a shared secret, use a public key and a private key um, to encode or decode the signature. Um, and if you have a public key which you want to share with other parties so they can validate your signature, you want to share it in a certain way um, with JSON web tokens, you can do this in a whole bunch of ways. And one, so one of them is using a JSON web key, a JWK. So if JWT, JWK, Again, JSON, so it just contains some information about the public key you can use to, ver to verify that the signature of a JSON web token is valid, a JSON uh, web token that has been signed by the private key matching this public key. Um, and you can usually find them if, you use, if you're using OpenID Connect. Usually you have an OpenID configuration somewhere publicly on your API. Um, one of those routes is just your jwks.json, and that looks a bit like this. And as you can see, it's just a bunch of information related to a public key. So JSON Web Token, JSON Web Key. There's also JSON Web Signature, which is basically just the bottom part of a JSON Web Token, a signature that you can use to verify something. Um, and JSON Web Encryption. Because the content of a JSON Web Token is just Base64, it is not secure. If you want to be able to secure that content even more, you can encrypt it with, for example, JSON Web Encryption, um, so that people only know how to know how to decrypt that content can see what's actually inside of that token. And that's not often being done, but if you want to be super secure, you can do that. Um, so let's make a little comparison. First, we have the header, and the header says, "I'm a JSON Web Token, and I'm signed with algorithm X." Now, on the right. Right, you have a Belgian passport, which says I'm a passport issued by the Kingdom of Belgium. Um, and it's in four languages, just because we like to make it difficult in Belgium. Um, but it basically just says what it is. It says I'm a password issued by Belgium. And the header of a JSON web token also just says I'm a JSON web token and have been signed by algorithm X. Now, if you open that password, password, you can see a lot of information about myself, my name, my last name but also when it expires, when it has been issued, my picture, some, some more detail ab about the use case of this passport. In this case, it could be a bit compared to a, uh, an ID token, which also contains information about the identity of somebody who just authenticated. Again, the name, um, username, and an expiry date. And if you look at a passport, it usually has a few features to determine that it's a valid passport, it's a real passport. And a JSON Web token has a signature, which kind of does the same. It validates that your, your JSON Web token has not been tampered with. So in essence, a JSON Web token, often in the form of an access, access token, it's a passport for an API. If you use it as an ID token, it's kind of a passport for somebody who authenticated. Um, but let's see it in action. I have this little app right here. Um, and what it does, it has, it has two buttons, and the first one let me see dog pictures, because we like to see dog pictures, right? Um, and the second button will let me see cat pictures. But if you own a cat and a dog, you might know that dogs are very easy. Cats are not as easy all of the time. So for it to see a cat picture, I need to be able to verify that it's me. I need to log in. Um, so if we press the login button on the top, it will take me to a login screen. And if I log in, and wait for the internet to do its thing. We get a failed demo. Um, luckily, I have a video of this. Um, so let's show that instead. So the same thing. If you click on the dog button, you get to see dog pictures. And then if you click on the cat button, it will tell you, hey, you need to log in to see cat pictures. So we log in by clicking on the right button. Um, go through the whole login process. And once that has been completed, you can see that on the right side we have my picture and my name available. And we are now also allowed to see the cat pictures because we have logged in. Um, and we'll end with this picture, which is my cat, and I'm quite proud of her. So if we go back to the, the thing, 
we saw that maybe on the top we saw that we have our picture, our name. This all came because we authenticated and got an ID token. As I've mentioned before, an ID token contains information about the identity of who authenticated. And we also got an access token, which we can use to request these cat pictures with our API, because access token tells the API that I'm allowed to um, get some cat pictures. If you would look at it from an API perspective, um, can you see this in the back? Is it big enough or do I have to enlarge it? Let's see if I can get it bigger. You're not in luck, this is the biggest. Um, but basically you have three endpoints, one to authenticate, which I'm going to send username and password, and it will give me a JSON web token, which is an access token, then the endpoint to get the dog pictures, and then the endpoint to get the cat pictures. So if you look at the authenticate, my username and password, if we send it, we get back a JSON web token. If I copy this, Um, for later. Then we have a second API endpoint just to get dog pictures, but we know that dogs are easy, so you don't need to authenticate for a dog picture. So every time I click on the send button, you might see that we get a different dog picture on the right. Um, but the same is not true for cat pictures. If I try to get a cat picture, it will tell me no authorization token was found. So we'll have to send it along as a bearer token. And once we do so, we get some cat pictures. Now, we've all, you've, you might have all done this, um, and you can do the same with a, a, an opaque um, token. So what are some of the strengths of a JSON web token? Let's see. If I would copy a token that is expired without doing some extra things, uh, if I paste it in here, so we try to use a token of which the expiry date has been in the past. My API already knows that this token has expired, so it will not accept this token, and I will not be able to get a cat picture. Um, and the same goes for if I use a token of which the signature does not match the payload and the header, which means that somebody tried to tamper with my token. The API will also tell you the signature is invalid. So without doing any more requests, just by looking at the content and the signature of your JSON web token, you can already rule out a lot of use cases that somebody tries to use a token, but is not allowed to anymore. Okay, so we've seen this website before, jsonwebtoken.io. It lets you just debug and create web tokens and see what's inside of them. It also contains some more information. So if you're working with web JSON web tokens and want to see what's actually going on, you can use this. Uh, we don't store these tokens anywhere. It just all happens on the front end, so it's kind of safe to use. Um, and we also have a, a handbook, which is an ebook, which goes very in depth in JSON web tokens and all of the security issues you might come across with and how to solve for them. So if you're interested in that. Uh, we have this ebook available for free for everybody who is interested in that. Um, so I've talked about this, and, and I kind of like JSON Web Tokens, but are there some downsides to JSON Web Tokens? Usually there are some downsides to anything. Um, and the first one is invalidation of a token is a bit harder. Just because the JSON Web Token contains all of the information about its validity inside of itself, the signature, the expiry date, the audience, if you want to limit it to certain APIs. Once you have issued this token, there's no way of revoking it until it expires naturally. So if you want to revoke a token that you've issued before, you kind of have to work with a blacklist or a whitelist and check for that blacklist first before validating the token. So that's a bit harder with a, with a JSON Web Token. The same thing is if you leak your secret or your, or your private keys, anybody can create a new token and impersonate your API or your authorization server. So once you leak those secrets or private keys, you're in trouble, but they're called secrets and private keys for a reason. So keep them secure. Um, and again, don't put any sensitive data inside of a JSON web token. It's base 64. We all know how to decode that. Don't do that. So token-based authentication. We have the same, same scenario as we had before. A user wants to use your website um, until he or she wants to um, access a protected page, a protected resource, a protected resource on your API. Again, username and password, and if it matches, we get our data back. But together with our data, instead of a cookie, we get, a J we get a, an access token back, and we, we can use this access token to access these protected resources. So we save this somewhere in memory. And the next time we want to request something protected, we send this, uh, access, this access token uh, to the API, and if it's valid, we get our data back. Kind of the same thing like the session ID in the cookie we saw in the beginning, but now using an access token instead. Um, 
And the important thing is that you send it here as a bearer token. Um, so the API can check that bearer token and see that the token is or is not valid. Um, OAuth, who's ever used or uh, heard of OAuth before? Most of you. If you do token-based authentication these days, you probably use OAuth. Um, and what it is, is it's a protocol that allows users to grant limited access to their resources. So it's made to, uh, to grant limited access. You can ac grant access to everything or just a certain part of your API. It's not meant to do authentication. It's not meant to handle identity details. It's only meant to, ex to grant access to certain parts of your data, your API, whatever you want. If, on the other hand, you also want to do some identification, some authorization, uh, authentication, you probably want to use OpenID Connect. Who's ever used OpenID Connect before? A few less hands. I'm assuming that most of you who have used OAuth also use OpenID Connect without knowing it, because OpenID Connect is basically an identity layer on top of OAuth. So you take everything which is an OAuth 2.0 and just add that ID token, that identity layer on top, and that's OpenID Connect. And this, this OpenID Connect does allow you to handle identity uh, authentication in a good way um, with tokens. Um, so for this example, I split up my authorization server for the rest of my API, same use case. Um, we send our credentials, username, and password. If they match, we get a, an access token, um, but we can also get an ID token and hit maybe very maybe, we can get a refresh token as well. Um, we save them in memory and use the access token whenever we want to use the access token and to get our data back. Um, but I've just mentioned that we save these tokens in memory. We don't save them in local storage. We don't save them in a cookie. We don't save them in session storage, IndexedDB, because when you save something in those storages, they're very vulnerable for cross-site scripting. And if somebody tries to steal or manages to steal your tokens, you're a bit of trouble because they can impersonate your users and do uh, things that you don't want them to do. So does this mean that users will have to log in with every visit since we don't save these tokens, these sessions somewhere persistently? There's a few ways around that. Um, the login flow stays the same and we get our tokens back, our access token, ID token, maybe refresh token, but instead we get a cookie as well. So we're back to cookies again. Um, and we save the cookie in the browser and the next time the user visits your website, it's going to do a silent request. As soon as your, your single page application um, bootstraps, it's going to do a silent request, get a session from that cookie, see if the, valid, the, the session is still valid on your authorization server. Does it in the background, usually in an iframe. Um, and if it's valid, we just get our tokens back on bootstrap. So basically, we get new tokens anytime the user visits or refresh, refreshes your web page. Um, and you get your tokens and you can use them. So only the cookie with the session ID is being stored, the same as the previous, um, the, the first example. But usually because you have a certain authorization server which has its own origin and you do, do it in an iframe which has a, a page of that same origin, you don't run into cost problems um, and you can still work with cookies and you request the tokens then to then use with all the different APIs um, you want to. So, this example was using the OAuth implicit flow. If you're a bit familiar with OAuth, there's a whole bunch of flows. And um, about a year ago, a little less, like 11 months, the IETF, the Internet Engineering Task Force, uh, published a new best practices document, which states that you should try to avoid the implicit flow when using with simple pa single page applications, just because there's a bunch of things that might go wrong. These are not new things. These have been known for a while. And most of the libraries we use to do OAuth or OpenID Connect um, with JavaScript mitigate these risks, um, but they publish this document um, anyway. And they recommend to use the authorization code with proof key for code exchange, which is a very long name, Pixie for short um, flow, which is a bit different. Um, the same thing goes, you, you just send your username and password um, to your authorization server, but together with that, you send a code challenge, which is just, let's call it a random generated something string. Um, your authorization server is going to save this, it's going to validate your username and password, but before it issues the tokens, it's going to send a code back to you, which you will then sign in a certain way, and you will send the code verifier back to the authorization server. And by matching this initial code and this code verifier, it can be sure that it was you who started the request and not somebody in the middle tried to um, steal something and do something bad. So if they verify, you get your tokens. So basically, you have two more steps, but it makes it a bit more secure, and it mitigates some of the risks which you have with the implicit flow. So if you're starting a new project, try to use the Pixie flow. If you're working on old projects, by all means, just keep on using the implicit flow because you probably mitigated all of the risks that are um, involved with that flow, and you don't have to start rewriting all of it uh, at once. Um, so a note about access tokens as JSON Web Tokens. OAuth and 
and OpenID Connect do not specify what format the JSON uh, in access token needs to be. It can be a, an opaque string, it can be a JSON up token, it does not matter as long as you know how to use that token, it's fine for auth. Um, there's an IETF draft to standardize this as a JSON web token and it looks a bit like this. Um, and as you see there in the middle you have a JSON web token but as type it says AT plus JSON web token, access token plus JSON web token. But for the rest, it's kind of just a JSON app token with a bunch of claims that are standardized to use with APIs. Um, on the other hand, ID tokens are always JSON web tokens. The OpenID Connect spec specifies that, it, that an ID token, the token that handles the identity of your users, is going to be a JSON web token. You cannot use anything else for that or you will not be following the standard, uh, standards as they uh, are written. Um, and what about refresh tokens and single page applications? Because who uses refresh tokens? Who likes refresh tokens? Nobody, because it's, so, it's such a powerful token and it allows you to generate new access tokens once they have expired, which is a good thing because you don't want to log in the user over and over and over again. So you want to just generate these access tokens on the fly with a refresh token. But they're also very, very dangerous if they leak, if somebody manages to steal them. And because with single page applications, everything handles, is every, everything, all logic is being handled on the front end, that becomes a great risk. Um, so using refresh tokens in the front end should be avoided unless a system of refresh token rotation or sender constraints is in place, which means that you rotate your uh, refresh tokens on a very steady basis or every time you use that refresh token, you invalidate it and you create a new one, same for access tokens, which is not being implemented by a lot of services, but new services and, and, and libraries are starting to implement this. So if your, your, your solution, whatever you built, used or bought does this, you can still use refresh tokens with single page applications. Um, the other thing, sender constraints, is very, something very nice in theory, but there's no practical way of doing this yet. There are some people thinking about this, but there's no way of doing this at the current moment. So unless you, you rotate your refresh tokens, try to avoid them on the front end. So does this approach solve course? Who thinks it does? I think it does. And I'm the only one probably. Um, but as long as you know how to validate a JSON web token, as long as you know how to read them, which is decoding that base64, and as long as you know how to validate the signature, so if you know the secret or have access to the public key, you can validate the token and you can use this token. Doesn't matter which origin that token comes from, as long as you know how to use them, you can use them on any origin so you can pass them along safely. Um, who does, who thinks that this approach solves for flow? I think it does, because as long as you know how to work with these JSON app tokens, it doesn't matter which service sends this token to you, you can still validate and see if it's valid for your use case, your API. So you can just pass them along. Usually you, you, you exchange them for a new token with your token endpoint in your authorization server, but you don't really have to because as long as you know how to use these tokens, you can pass them along from service to service to service. And who thinks this, uh, this approach solves keeping state? I don't see any hands. Um, and in theory it does, because this JSON app token contains all the information inside of it. But because there are some issues, um, you want to be a bit more secure, or you want to keep a blacklist to invalidate tokens, you're still back to state. If you want to use a cookie-based approach, we saw at the end to issue the tokens every time the user requests uh, your web page or does a refresh or whatever, you kind of need some state. So in theory, it solves for state, but in practice, you still need some kind of state. So it doesn't manage to, uh, to solve that. So let's have a quick look at the future of authentication. I'm talking about the Web Authentication API. Who's ever heard of this? A few very low hands, okay. Uh, it's often called Web Authent, so if you want to le learn more about this, just Google Web Authent instead of the Web Authentication API. And basically what it means is no more passwords, because at this mo moment, passwords are still the, le the weakest link in the authentication flow. Um, so if we can get rid of them, that would be very nice. Um, so you can say, well, it's not new. I've had passwordless log login for a while now. If I go to Slack, I can just get an email link, uh, a link in an email sent to me and just click that and then I have to type password. That's true, but this is something native implemented on web browsers. And um, it means you can log in with an authenticator device. We'll see what it is later. Um, it's often just a USB drive or it can be built into your device or whatever. But basically, when you want to access a protected resource, um, your authorization server is going to send a challenge, which is a random array buffer. Um, and this authorization, uh, authentication device is going to sign that, um, send along a, a public key, a raw ID, and the signed challenge. 
um, and you just validate that on your server. I'm not going to go into the details of this because it gets a bit complicated, but what it means is you can log in with an authenticator device, which I don't have in my pocket. Um, but if I, if I would click this button, I could basically log in with a USB drive. Now, who has one of these USB drives, like it's a Yubi key or a Google Titan key or some of those? A few hands. And as this is the future of authentication, it would be nice if all of us could, would be able to use that, right? Um, luckily, um, who has a device that's younger than 10 years, like a mobile phone or a laptop or anything? And I think we all have to raise our hands. And luckily, all modern devices have a dedicated chip in their chipset, which does exactly the same thing. Um, an iPhone, an Intel chipset, whatever, they all have this special chip which um, handles credentials, which um, allows you to create credentials and store them on that chip, and which allows you to use these credentials to sign certain things. Um, so if you look at the second example, um, I'm going to use the built-in one of my MacBook. Um, so I click on this button, it asks me to touch my Touch ID. If I touch this, um, I feel allowed because I'm localhost. But basically, I just got a challenge, signed it with my uh, special chip in my MacBook, and I just authenticate it using my Touch ID. And I get back a raw ID of a private key which is on that chip. So basically, you can log in with just an authenticator device, either an external one or a built-in one. Um, and how does this work? There's two methods. The first thing you have to do is register a new credential. So for every website, you're going to create a new private key, public key pair on that chipset, on that uh, authenticator device, um, using navigator.credentials.create. It, ac it accepts some, uh, some config, so you're going to ch create a challenge, which you're going to send to that authenticator device to, to sign it, and that's um, a random uh, array buffer. You're going to send some data about the relaying party, the um, the website or the author authorization server that's going to do the uh, authentication request, some information about the user, um, and then some information about which authenticator devices you want to allow. For example, you want to allow the built-in ones, the external ones, both of them. Do you want to only allow um, authenticator devices that verify the user? For example, my MacBook has Touch ID, so it verifies me with my fingerprint, while a, an external USB drive might not verify my identity, just my presence. Um, so you can just kind of filter out which devices you want to use. Um, so if, once you've registered your credential, this credentials is going to be saved on that chipset, on that authenticator device, and you're going to save the, uh, the public key somewhere on your server. Um, and the next time you're going to do navigator.credentials.get, and again, just um, pass along some JSON. Um, again, a challenge to sign with your authenticator device. Um, and then the allowed credentials, which is going to be the raw ID of the credential we created in the first step, which we save somewhere in our database. So we're going to say to our authenticator device, please use this private key to sign this challenge, and I can then use the public key I save with it later on to verify that it's the same device that signed both challenges, uh, which means that I can verify that it was the same user that has been trying to authenticate. Um, and again, you can um, filter out which authenticator devices you want to use. Um, if you want to know more about this, we, we have this website, webauthn.me, um, which has a whole bunch of information. It has an interactive tutorial, which you can follow. Um, so if you type in your name, you can see what's going on, the back and forth between browser and uh, relaying party. Um, there's some information, and it also has a debugger, which basically lets you change all of this config that both of these methods accept and see what happens, see what changes, um, play around with the, um, with the API. So let's summarize. Using session cookies is very hard to single page applications, mainly due to cores. Status, status authentication is possible with JSON web tokens, asterisks because of some blacklists or because of some security issues you want to solve. JSON Web Tokens consist out of three different parts. The header, which has some information about what it is. The payload, which has some information about why you want, well, you want to use this token, so for an API or an identity or something else. And a signature, which lets you verify the contents of the JSON Web Token. And in the future, we can use WebAuthn to log in users without the annoying passwords. If you want to know more, jsonwebtoken.io, webauthn.me. We also have a very good blog post explaining what's wrong with the implicit flow of OAuth and why um, the IETF um, suggests to use the Pixie flow. It goes a bit into detail about the whys and what's wrong and how the, one, uh, the Pixie flow solves um, the issues of the implicit flow. And our blog is generally full of other good blog posts. If you want to see the slides again, jwt.sambega.tech. I will tweet them later as well. 
Um, so if you want to take a picture, go ahead. Otherwise, check my Twitter later. Um, thank you very much. Do we have questions? One question, yeah. Uh, great talk, and I'm a big fan of Office Air. We use it all the time. Uh, <laughs> nice to hear. Um, the web, how well supported is the web authentication? The web authentication API, so web authent is supported by all major browsers as of Safari 13, which is released, I think, last month or in September, the end of September. So the basic, um, um, authentication flow in, of the basic authentication API is supported by Safari, Chrome, Firefox, and Edge, and especially you now that Edge is going to Chromium, it has all the features of Chrome. There's some advanced features with this web authentication API, which I didn't talk about, like saving credentials on the authenticator device and having some other uh, like user credentials and stuff. That's only supported by Chrome these days, but the basic flow, it's all modern browsers. So you, you can try it out. Major websites like Google, GitHub, Dropbox, they all support this as a second factor and some of them even as a first factor um, if you want to use it or try it out. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Let's get some coffee.